Well, good evening. And again, thank you for joining us for our Bible study uh, tonight here on Wednesdays as we move our way through the book of Acts. Uh, thanks again for everybody for sending in all their great questions that they've had thus far. We've really enjoyed those. Actually, we have a question-free week today, so our study might be a little bit shorter. I know, don't. No promises yeah, yet. Yeah, no, no, no promises yet. We'll see, we've got quite a few verses today. Uh, today, uh, we're looking at Acts chapter 5, kind of a series of a couple different stories that intersect here. Uh, if you remember, we left off last week in chapter 4 talking about uh, the uh, apostles receiving so many uh, well, uh, just blessings and gifts uh, placed upon the church and at their feet because of all the Christians being involved in unity and wanting to support the church so much. And so today that story kind of continues on a little bit. Again, thank you for joining myself and Pastor Mark today as we have this opportunity to jump into the Word. And so let's do that today. Uh, Acts chapter 5, beginning at verse 1, if you're following along with us. Yeah, and just the kind of the We intro. almost started. We almost started. Just to the intro. Yeah. To, uh, so chapters 3, 4, and 5. Are, are really a tale of two temples. And there's a pretty beautiful symmetry. And this is the outline of, uh, of how it kind of breaks down. And so the end of chapter four, if you remember Barnabas, how he sold everything. And then the beginning of chapter five, we're gonna read about Ananias and Sapphira who sold, sell everything. And this is kind of these two kind of maybe bizarre, right? Stories kind of right in the middle of what's going on in the church right now and what Peter and John, what they're preaching. And it sets it up as we see the beginning, right before this incident and right after this incident. We see the disciples gathering daily in the temple courts, gathering in their houses, sharing Jesus, breaking bread. And we see the beginning of the persecution of the church where mm -hmm. Peter's healing and he's preaching in the temple and they keep getting arrested and being tried. And then right in the middle of these kind of sandwiched between these events is this story of how the disciples were uh, giving everything they had, everything they could uh, to just serve the people and their physical needs. And that is, again, the tale of two temples. When, uh, when you read in De Deuteronomy 14 and 15, this was a practice that was described in the Torah. This is what the temple was supposed to be doing all along, mm -hmm. uh, not worried about their own Vestments and their ceremonies and their, but actually to be the hub there, uh, to where if anybody had need, they could uh, be filled. If mm -hmm. anybody had excess, they could give and support their their brothers and sisters. And so, Luke here is trying to very vividly show how the new church is the new temple. Jesus is the new temple. We are now the body of Christ, and we're fulfilling. Uh, the role that God had in store for the temple from the beginning. Hmm. And it's not a new religion. It's, it's a it's an ultimate fulfillment of the Israelites who, who had followed Yahweh, God, uh, for all those years. So the new temple of Jesus' community is now where people encounter God's generosity and healing presence. With that, we'll jump into verse 1. Now we start. Perfect. That's how the verse 1 starts. Now, a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back a part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you have received for the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied to men, but to God. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died, and great fear seized all who heard what happened. Then the young man came forward, wrapped up his body, and carried him out to bury him. About three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Peter asked her, Tell me. Is this the price you and Ananias got for the land? Yes, she said, that is the price. Peter said to her, How could you agree to test the Spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out also. At that moment, she fell down at his feet and died. Then the young man came 
and in finding her dead, carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. Wow. DFLC.org slash give. <laughs> That's all I really need to say about that passage. Yeah, yeah. you got to get down to this because truly, in just reading straight through this, that's what it feels like, right? Well, I mean, these people have this land, this house. They sell this. Who knows how much they're getting? Is, is it is it 80% or 50 or 20? Who cares? It's, it's a large sum that's probably being handed over. But because they don't hand over the whole thing, they die? So, like, here's what I think. Like, it had to be enough money that they gave where it could have been the sale price. Okay, right? yeah, because yeah, yeah. Because you could give like a buck. That's like true. Two bucks and be like, yeah. So it had to be for. significant. You think, right? So they're making this great gift out of their own generosity, but they're struck down dead? What? Why is this? Before you try to tackle that, I just kind of the way it ends, why? The, the whole, like everybody in the church was terrified. Yeah, oh yeah, I wonder <laughs> it's why. It's kind of scary yeah. today too. Yeah, I wonder why, yeah. <laughs> I, I, you know, I think the key is in verse four. Yeah, it wasn't a sin for them to give a portion of their proceeds. That was, I think they were free to give, keep whatever percent uh, was on their heart. But I think at the end of verse four, when Peter tells of him, "You have not lied to men, but to God." Yeah, there it is. So I think. Telling everybody, yes, we just gave, we sold this, and we given it all to the church. Yep. You can even see like the collusion that happens even right before that. Verse four is definitely the key, but there's like this collusion that happens in verse two. With his wife's full knowledge, he mm -hmm. kept back part of the money for himself. So it's it's not like oh everybody knows about this, but with his wife's full, you know, we're in on this together let's make this happen we'll look great but this way we still keep some of what we know is ours too and isn't that like our our attitude that well this is mine you know i don't i want to give this this is this is mine and i see part of that like in my thinking is being a good steward with the lord too when we talk about you know tithing 10 percent of what we have or what we make or just even making offerings unto the lord Often that's the hurdle that we have to get over as Christians or as the church of thinking, well, this is mine, not, well, this is actually the Lord's that he has given us to manage on behalf of him. And in, in this context, on behalf of his people, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, going back to the, the collusion of the, the husband and wife to pull this off. Um, I, I still try to find out, you know, what, what are some lessons that we can learn out of this? It's again it's not that we have to give a hundred percent of everything to the church though we are free to do that yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. we have the freedom of the gospel to do what we want um, one thing I see is uh, it's a it's a pretty good reminder that God knows our heart mm. and so whatever front we want to put up or face we wear mask we wear or uh, show some outward you know actions of being holy or I don't know, wonderful, generous. Um, you know, God knows our heart. There's, yeah. there's no, like, I guess Ananias and Sapphira were kind of they could, could thought they could collude with each other and keep their secret uh, between themselves. But God knows, God sees, God hears. You know, there's no secrets we can keep from Him. And that's the calling there, I guess. Right when Peter says, you know, how can you, how can you test the spirit? of God, you know, you're, you're going to do this, like, this is what you're, you're really going to do, you don't have to prove anything to me or to any of these, these people, mm -hmm. you know, who's really being able to give you this calling and being able to, if you will, judge you at the end of the day is the, is the Lord based off of the relationship that we have with him. In the end, it kind of becomes this big story of, uh, I think there's hypocrisy that's there and deceit is what I wrote down. Like the two things that these people they're, they're being hypocrites and saying that we should give all of our things and they're being deceitful and just in the end just keeping it for themselves for sure so I mean again just the calling for us to I don't know really check ourselves of what our motivations and who are we serving at the end of the day yeah well, I had a couple more thoughts maybe we could hit on this passage one just the kind of the contrast in comparison to just right before that you know last week in the chapter 4 Barnabas yeah and his introduction to us in the story 
Um, he becomes an important player later in, in the church. Uh, just his, just uh, generous, just open, just sp seems spontaneous mm -hmm. reaction like, oh, this is what Jesus did for me. This is, this is what I want to do for his church. Uh, selling it all, giving it all. Uh, compared really immediately after with the story. Oh, and, you know, that was Barnabas. Oh, yeah, and yeah. there was this couple named yeah. Ananias, and, and this is what they did. This is the yeah. path they chose. Yeah. All right, and the, the last kind of little thought I had on this. Oh, I'll get your, pick your brain on this. Um, so they were all uh, afraid, mm. right? Yeah, great, last verse, yeah. great fear came upon the whole church and upon all who had heard of these things. So I think about, uh, so all the people in the church obviously knew what happened, but this was so, you know, spectacular. I mean, this kind of made the local news too. Yeah. This would have been in the Jerusalem Times the next morning. <laughs> yeah. Right? A couple dropped dead in church from lying. <laughs> uh, so even people who heard about it were like, whoa. So what are your thoughts on fearing God? Mm. Like the first commandment, we'll say, uh, the first commandment is, you shall have no other gods. And Martin Luther kind of fleshed it out by saying, what does this mean? Uh, that means that we should fear, love, and trust in God above all things. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Love and trust kind of, we get, oh yeah, of course we love and trust. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But the concept fear? of fear. What is that? We don't talk about that, I guess, a lot with God and how that's maybe properly described, but there's some help in that too, because when they talk about it here, I guess you could maybe explain it away in a couple different ways, but they're talking about true fear that's, that's mentioned here, and part of that is, I think, because people saw there are real consequences that come from not following God's word. Is he forgiving? Of, of course. Is he loving? Of course. Does he want us to trust him? Yeah, but at the end of the day, you know, uh, there's this healthy aspect of knowing that there are true consequences for sin, right? Not fearing God because God pronounces the punishment down upon us and he's looking to do that. God isn't looking to be able to punish us in any way, but he is looking to be able to hold us accountable at the same time, too. It's important for us to remember for every sin that we commit, there's a great hefty price that was paid for that sin. Just as we see in our text for today, or for any sins that, that we commit. And there's something healthy, I think, about that, of knowing you know, that there's this importance of being able to know that there's a consequence for our action. Because if there are never any consequences, we will just act however we want. If there's no consequences at the end of the day, uh, many people will just choose their own selfishness over and over and over again. And why, why wouldn't we? Mm -hmm. uh, and so we need to recognize, again, that there are those consequences and that God paid the price for us. And don't we want to uh, be able to respect that and the price that he paid too? Yeah, absolutely. I think, uh, I, I like to say that too, kind of a healthy dose of fear. Sure. I think is a good thing. I don't, no, nobody should be terrified of God. We should be afraid to come to God. We should be scared to talk to God. Certainly shouldn't be afraid to confess our sins uh, to God. Uh, at the same time, uh, I don't. I don't think. I don't think it's best if we're just overly familiar, if you will. Hey, yo, Jesus, he's my buddy. Yeah. Um, well, he's the King of Kings. Like he's the King of the Universe. Uh, there's some healthy dose of respect. When I think of what Luther was saying, um, the way I hear it, um, we fear and love and trust in God above all things. Uh, you know every. Every commandment we break, every sin we break, is also breaking the first commandment. Mm -hmm. Because I, I am not fearing God's judgment on that sin more than you know to actually not do it. Yep. Um, I'm not loving God as much as He loved me to forgive me of that sin. I'm not trusting in God to provide everything I need. Uh, so I'm going to go take it on my own, or however that you know sin plays out. So fear, loving, and trusting. And uh, also the healthy dose of fear. I always think of what my dad used to tell me from time to time. Son, I brought you into this world, and I can take you out. <laughs> I mean, I mean that's the reality, right? God has given us life, and he could. Now, that's not who he is. 
uh, right? But just to respect that power sure. that he has. Though you did something wrong when you were a kid, right? And mom's home with you and she says, hey, just wait till dad gets home, right? Yeah. That was kind of always <laughs> like, oh, oh no. spent all that time oh, of like, no. <laughs> what's gonna happen? What's gonna happen? Yeah. <laughs> but being able to help you have that healthy respect for your father, yeah. yeah. All right, Acts chapter five, verse 12, moving along. Many signs and wonders were regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostles. And they were all together in Solomon's portico. None of the rest dared join them, but the people held them in high esteem. More people than ever believed and were added to the Lord, multitude of both men and women, so that they even carried out the sick into the streets and laid them on cots and mats, that as Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on some of them. Isn't that amazing? That the sh his shadow, yeah, just a shadow would bring the healing from God. Uh, the people also gathered from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all healed. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, just when I think about that comment about the shadow there, you think about uh, other pieces, like think about the the woman who just wanted to touch the cloak of Christ, right? Just so she could be healed. Just to have the have small the piece, yep. right? Yeah. Give me a little little drop. Yeah. That's all I need. And it wasn't about that cloak or about the, the shadow per se, but yeah, that faith that's believing that that healing exists there. Uh, very, very strong. Yeah. Well, again, so they continue healing. You got any comments on this center section here? No, just so this outline of this section, you know, he's contrasting the, the two temples. And so you see the the healing uh, that, that God is working, the miracles that he's doing, still as signs, as, as testimonies to, to the message that they're preaching, that Jesus crucified and risen and is now Lord of all, Savior of all. And so a lot of this is told to kind of set up, so remember they're still doing this. Now remember they've been warned. And so what happens uh, after that? Well, they enter into another time of persecution then, verse 17. So then the high priest and all his associates, who were members of the party of the Sadducees, were filled with jealousy. Interesting comment there, jealousy. They arrested the apostles and put them in the public jail. But during the night in the public jail, uh, excuse me, but during the night an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail and brought them out. Go stand in the temple courts, he said, and tell the people the full message of this new life. At daybreak, they entered the temple courts, and as they had been told, and began to teach to the people. When the high priest and his associates arrived, they called together the Sanhedrin, the full assembly of the elders of Israel, and sent to the jail for the apostles. But on arriving at the jail, the officers did not find them there, so they went back and reported. We found the jail securely locked with the guards standing at the doors, but when we opened them, we found no one inside. On hearing this report, the captain of the temple guard and the chief priests were puzzled, wondering what would come of this. Then someone came and said, Look, the men you put in jail are standing in the temple courts teaching the people. At that, the captain went with his officers and brought the apostles. Uh, and this, the, they did not use force because they feared that the people would stone them. Having brought the apostles, they made them appear before the Sanhedrin, uh, to be questioned by the high priest. We gave you strict orders not to teach in his name, he said, yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Let me pause there before we keep going. Yeah. <clears throat> well, there's so many things that happen that just kind of make you smile a little bit. Yeah. Uh, through, through the whole book of Acts. But I, here I think, so if, if you were just especially miraculously released from an unjust imprisonment. Yeah. What would be like the first thing you would naturally I gotta, want to do? Got to run. You're out of there, man. Out of there. Yeah, two, two cities over. You can go preach there. Yep. Yep. Nope. But, but they're given very specific directions, right? Uh, very specific directions about where to go and what to do uh, of this calling that they have received. But even with that, I still would have thought, Oh, I can come back and do that later. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I'll sneak back in yeah, yeah. After, after it cools off. Maybe a couple months from now, I'll come yeah. back and check that out. No, the next day. Yeah. Like, hey, 
Hey, those guys you arrested, they're standing right in the temple yeah, on yeah. the steps. We can't find them. Jesus em. loves you! <laughs> yeah, yeah. We can't find them. And then they go right out there and they start doing exactly what they were told not to, to be able to do. Uh, I, I don't know, just amazing, like, the faith that they have, right, to be able to know that the Lord is always going to, and maybe it's not even take care of them, but always be faithful to his message, that the Lord's going to use them to be able to uh, convert others to Christianity. And imagine what a testimony that must have been to the people, too, right? That they know, everybody knows these guys have been put in jail. They know they've been slapped on the on the wrist. Even said that in one of our last chapters, that they went back and told the people everything that had, had happened. And so to see these people, these men, being able to, to preach Christ crucified and his resurrection, that must have uh, really been something monumental with those people because they knew the pressure these guys were under. They knew the, the persecution that they were under. For them to stick their necks out, most of those people must have thought, there's something to this, right? These mm -hmm. guys aren't these guys aren't crazy. They're, they're not loons. We know who they are. But if this means this much to them, maybe I should listen today. Maybe I should check this out. Mm -hmm. And maybe there's a calling there for us, too, right, of uh, being able to be I don't know, just founded in the principles of our faith that God has given to us and be able to, even when we're under persecutions, probably not of this level, but in some countries for sure, be able to still be able to share who, who Christ is and know that this is our calling too, that God has freed us from the prison of death and from sin and that we need to tell other people too that they can be released from that at the same time. Yeah, and again, it can be so simply personal. It, it doesn't have to be a doctrinal sermon from the Bible. Mm -hmm. it, it's just telling what Jesus has done. Or, or even, um, so I've used that example, but how about uh, just in conversations today about what's going on in the world? You, know, you could just simply say, you know, it, it's crazy. The world is, you know, everything going on today is crazy. You know, I believe in God. And I don't think I'll ever understand why everything happens, but I think it's pretty obvious that sin is real. Mm. And just the depravity of humans is real. It's a real problem that we have. And the God who created this great world and all these people, that wasn't his intention. Uh, he wanted this beautiful place with yeah. beautiful relationships. Um, and we, our selfishness and pre everything is just muddy, stained. Everything is created, hurt relationships. Uh, it made it so difficult for us to get along. And so I believe God sent his solution in Jesus. That's what that was about. That was to take away the sin of the world. Um, through, through Jesus, I'm forgiven and you can be too. Mm -hmm. And really, that's the hope for our world, right? For everybody to turn to Jesus, to repent yeah. of their sins and to trust in God for their life and their salvation, their eternal life. Because they're not going to find it on their own. They're not going to find justice, not going to find peace, not going to find love. It's not going to come from within us. It's just not. And it's funny you see in this text uh, the people that are against this they do make it all about them over and over again. Uh, that first verse that we read says uh, that they're that they're jealous. Uh, mm -hmm. Then the high priest and all his associates were members of the party, and the Sadducees they were filled with jealousy. So in the beginning of the section we just read, it starts about them, and then same thing where uh, it concludes at in verse twenty-eight. There, uh, we gave you strict orders not to teach in his name. He said. Yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. They're hearing the same words that these other individuals are hearing. Hey, you know, you guys, yeah, you put him to death, but through this death, you are forgiven of all your sins. But still, they, they can't get over that hump of themselves, of that selfishness that truly relies in all of us. That, well, no, you're determined to, to judge me, right? You talk about judgment in our world today, of uh, people saying that, well, you're judging me. No, they're making this about them, themselves, you know? They're preaching this forgiveness. All of us truly are sinners, but we have to get over ourselves, I think, first to be able to 
recognize that to, in order to receive this great gospel news. So interesting yeah, that kind of the selfishness that we see there echoed over and over again. All right, uh, Acts 5, 29. But Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised Jesus, again, <laughs> whom you killed by hanging him on a tree. Again, these are the actual people <laughs> he's talking to. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses of these things. He's saying that again. And so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. When they heard this, they were enraged and wanted to kill them. This is great. But a Pharisee in the council named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, held in honor by all the people, stood up and gave orders to put the men outside for a little while. And he said to them, men of Israel, take care what you are about to do with these men. For before these days, Theodos rose up, claiming to be somebody, and a number of men, about 400, joined him. He was killed, and all who followed him were dispersed and came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean rose up in the days of the census and drew away some of the people after him. He too perished, and all who followed him were scattered. So in the present case, I tell you, Keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan or this undertaking is of man, it will fail. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You might even be found opposing God. So they took his advice. And when they had called in the apostles, they beat them, <laughs> okay, and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Then they left the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. Interesting, this, this Pharisee that stands up and kind of stops and basically says, hey, if it, this isn't real, you know, what do you guys have to worry about? You know, don't, don't really worry about it. This thing will it'll die out. And he, he gives two other historic events that are there for everybody to say, hey, you remember case A, you remember case B, something happened, you guys were worried about it then, and those are gone. Yeah, you know? well, once the leader died, the movement ended. Yep. And he's saying, hey, their leader, Jesus, died. Yep. And so if it's a man, it'll end. Yeah. So, yeah. Now, Gamaliel is, uh, so the, one of the, he says he's highly honored by yeah. all the people. Yeah. Uh, and he was. Um, so in this day, obviously, there weren't like institutional colleges and universities. You learned in a trade, you went as an apprentice to whatever, a blacksmith, a carpenter, or, you know, if you were going into the religious world, you know, you would, you would take a rabbi or like, uh, like Gamaliel. He was highly honored. He was like, uh, so when Paul says in uh, Acts 22, 3, that he was a student of Gamaliel, it, he's telling the people, hey, I went to Harvard. Yeah, okay? yeah. I know the Jewish law. I know the Jewish faith. I know the Jewish customs. And listen to me tell you about Jesus and how you fulfill this. So anyway, Gamaliel, highly respected. And we were, to make sure everybody caught that, Paul was his student, correct? Yes. Right? Yeah, yeah. Definitely his most famous student. Yeah, and that, I mean, that's, that's pretty... And obviously the guy has a good reputation, if you will, right, for him to stand up and everybody kind of pauses, and they all listen, right? They, they want to kill these guys, and for him to have enough persuasion or clout to be able to stop these, whatever, 70 other guys that are gathered there to all say, okay, well, we're not going to kill them. You know, let's go ahead and go with this one guy's advice. You know, there's some good strengthening that's that's there too, and somebody who you know was used by the Lord in this instrumental way to be able to continue yeah. this mission that's here. You know, he spared their lives. I think it's again, you kind of smile, right? Yeah. It says the the Sanhedrin, the ruling council, you know, the religious leaders, they heeded his advice. So instead of killing them, they just beat them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let them live. Let them go. Okay. <laughs> but that's the best, right? They did they, save their life. <laughs> that's the best. They beat them, though. It says they, in my text, it says they flogged them. So, they, I mean, this is bad. Like, this isn't like, they're yeah. not slapping them, you know, like, 
these guys are, they're probably heavily wounded at yeah. this time. But it says that they uh, go out and that they start rejoicing, are the words that mm-hmm. it used. Because they have suffered disgrace, so they, in the they are this in the name. And uh, yeah. the, the actual verbiage, their name, the N is capitalized, recognizing you know, that they have done this in the, the name of Christ, you know, their, their one and only Savior. And that's funny, yeah, that even though that maybe people look down upon them because of what had happened, you know, they're, it's a criminal, right? These are, these are felons now that are coming out of here. They know that they've suffered these things uh, because of their Lord and Savior. Yep, and then this, uh, this section here contrasting the two temples ends with this you know, last verse. Um, and every day in the temple and from house to house, mm. they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. That's a great place for us maybe to conclude here today and, and even think about, again, in these times that we're at, uh, you know, we're doing different things to be creative of online Bible studies or trying to do small Saturday morning uh, communion services. Uh, but whatever we're doing, whether it's here uh, on campus, in our congregation setting, uh, whether it's in house to, to house, that we're able to, to have this ministry, that the church is always alive because of who Christ is, not because of our setting but that this can be portrayed uh, in any place and through any scenario, right? The mm-hmm. good or the bad. Uh, so maybe again, another push for us today as, as Christians, you know, to be able to release that jealousy that we have, be able to release our control that sometimes we think we own on our possession or the, the things that we have, and really start focusing on that first commandment of how are we serving God and lifting Him up first above everything and as christ says the second that is so important loving our neighbor as ourselves and i don't know if there's any better way to be able to love your neighbor than to share with them the the true gospel of christ that releases all of us from that prison of hell that we so much deserve but don't receive because of what jesus has given to us amen perfect perfect conclusion all right you want to pray for us we're done all right Heavenly Father, we are grateful that you have this uh, amazing, awesome, and intricate plan uh, for your church uh, from the very beginning of time. Uh, And you are not surprised by uh, anything that we face. Uh, You have and will continue to prepare us to stand for you, uh, even when we uh, wonder and question uh, and, and maybe even be afraid what's going on around us or what how it might impact us or your church we put our faith and our confidence in you Uh, help us in the midst of things we cannot understand to just find our hope and our peace in Jesus Christ whom our sins uh, caused him to be crucified but you you raised him from the dead and continue to do uh, amazing signs as testimonies uh, testimony to the to your truth, the word of truth. Uh, We pray for everyone uh, joining us today uh, digitally. Uh, We just pray you would uh, continue to have your hand over them to protect them and to keep them well. Help us to continue to move forward as a church family, sharing your gospel in every context that we uh, find ourselves in. Uh, Always lead us and direct us in in your will. After these things, Lord, uh, we ask it in the name of Jesus Christ.